do you think it's possible to to write in a way and tell a story in a way that really does treat movements as characters that can be relatable? I mean, how much do you think the choice to focus on individuals is a kind of a, you know, psyop to alienate people or make people feel like they can't be the one or be intimidated by participating themselves? And how much is kind of a feature of human psychology and our inability to focus on, you know, to distinguish more, you know, you know, what's, what's the study that shows you can't look at a group of items and count them in a glance once it's over 10, you know, once mm. it's, or whatever the number is that at a certain point you have to go one, two, three, you can't just yeah. look at it and see, oh, I have three objects sitting on the table, you know? Yeah. Well, it, well, humanity yeah. is about, I mean, you know, I don't know. I think humanity is about human connection and and we want stories about people right mm -hmm. that, you know we don't want and 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 um so getting to know the character is uh, is important getting to know the people involved is important um i think that uh <clears throat> there are certain you know there 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 are certain forms of art that um you know, let's say you look at a great mural and it has different people in it. And sometimes you feel like you can you, you get something about all of the people. In it. And, you know, that's a certain format. Like, how do you make that happen with stories? That's you know, that's a question that people are going to be trying to have, you know, answer for a while. I think um, I think there's a lot of ways to get to know characters. I think there are a lot of ways to to uh, kind of simulate going through the world. Like sometimes you meet someone and you don't need to know their whole backstory of like how they grew up and who hurt them in the past. And you know what, but, but you're connecting on one particular thing and their actions in those areas as you know them are what tells you who they are, mm. right? And um, so I think there's there's a lot to, you know, and I, I think some of our ways of looking at how we should look at stories have been trained by like soap operas and and TV where they're really just trying to fill up time because they <laughs> they didn't have any more stories. So they're about to tell you about uh, this guy's grandma and we're going to flash back to that for a long time. And, you know, and then when we don't see it, then people are like, man. And so, you know, um, you know, I, I and I don't know what's right or wrong, but but that's you know I, I you know I, I I don't necessarily do that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I I struggle with this because with the Black Panther example, for instance, I definitely take your point, and I found um I found your messaging uh, about the the reasons why kind of. Um, singular heroes can sometimes fail and how ego can be derailing in a movement to be very compelling. At the same time, when you gave the Black Panther example, I think, like, I, I'd imagine there are quite a few people who also were drawn to want to join the organization, perhaps for superficial reasons, and that's not ideal, but who might otherwise have never been drawn to participate and maybe learn more and learn other reasons why they wanted to be involved pre precisely because of the aesthetics. I remember my mom talking about being in, you know, whatever the Junior Black Panthers or it was called and talking about how as just a little kid, she was attracted to it because they, they, I mean, they looked cool. I mean, what are you? You're seven. What do you care about? They looked cool. And, you know, as a, as a comms person, I'm always considering, well, how do you make this seem appealing? Because so much of the criticism on the left, right, is that it is boring and theory laden and uh, a bunch of, you know, PhDs trying to explain why you haven't read X, Y, and Z book thoroughly enough and they've got, you know, Gramsci on their T-shirts or whatever. Uh, and that's why some movements like the Bernie 2016 movement in particular got written off as kind of white and male and disconnected from the demographic groups that they purported to want to uplift in the first place. I, mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, what, what do you, what do you make of that? Like, is it all so bad to try to make something seem appealing and do 
like famous people, public figures um, play a role in that, especially given how hostile mainstream media is to giving a fair hearing to left ideas. Well, I think that, uh, you know, if people have a following uh, that them showing what their ideas are and what their what movements they're uniting with helps a lot. Um, I definitely think that, you know, obviously I'm an artist. I think that style matters, hmm. right? That's all I do is style. Hmm. And, um, and, and, you know, in, in, in songs, whatever it, it's, you know, putting things together in a certain way that I think works. And obviously anytime, whether it's a conversation someone's having or not, they have to be aware of those things. And, and so, uh, you know, those things matter. That's very different than creating um, a situation where you, where, where this person is the one that's going to save folks. Right. Yeah. Or the, the, you know, um, because, you know, you can look at, you know, how, what, what works. One, one interesting thing I saw that was, you know, maybe with, you know, that, that kind of is putting both of those two things together and might've been like 10 years ago, uh, I visited this uh, Central Social in, in uh, Milan, Italy, and it was one that was all everybody there was they had they have weird divisions in the squat the squats are central social and and this one was all people that were under the age of 26 or something like that and um they had a leader and i forget what the name was and the leader's name meant uh tidal wave in italian i don't remember what their name was, but but uh and and it was a and the leader was a total made up cartoon figure hmm. right and uh and name this and name tidal wave meaning that they were all do you know they they were forming this movement that was like a tidal wave and they would say that this person says this and you knew it was made by the collective of people and you know they made images for people to rally around and so hmm. obviously i i think that images sounds all those things are things that we create uh, for folks to rally around. But but I think that, um, you know, we, we look at the Panthers and, you know, I think we talk about them too much. So I'm going to try to, you know, <laughs> condense that. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of reasons that they failed. Some of them were COINTELPRO, but some of them were directions they took. And, um, and, whether the, or not they were able to connect with the black community that they thought they were that they were set out to connect with and that yeah. had to do with uh the imaging that had to do with the campaigns that they, I mean you know Oakland at the time was full of factories that yeah, yeah black folks were working there you don't hear them at all talking about organizing strikes or anything like that matter of fact some of them came from longshoremen and became Black Panthers, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we can look at. And I don't think, I don't think that the Black Panther success was just because of their image, not saying that doesn't, that doesn't have anything to do with it. But yeah, you know, we want to make a revolution that connects with people, not only where they are, but with their dreams of who they can be. You've said right. that that you never uh, endorsed a political candidate before Bernie Sanders. And when you were talking to, I think, maybe Fah Shakur, Shakur um, campaign manager, uh, part of what brought you over was the idea of the value of someone with the pulpit of the presidency calling for strikes. Uh, and so not the figure him, himself, but the ability for someone with the biggest platform in the country ostensibly to empower the people in the ways that you've um, depicted in your movies and which you're participating in now. Mm -hmm. um, obviously he did, didn't become president, but he's still a sitting Senator and we're in the middle of one of the largest strike, strike waves in American history. 
And I, I wonder what you make of how he and other ostensibly left political figures are situating themselves in this moment, using their platforms. You know, I, do you have regrets? I, I, have, I haven't been I haven't been following uh, him since then. I, I So I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot of things that uh, could be said, but I, I would be ill-informed about them to, uh, and wouldn't be able to speak about them. But what I would say is that, um, you know, the the whole thing, like as, as, as you mentioned, was that in order to get Medicare for all, it wasn't going to be just Bernie winning. It was going to have to be, uh, it, it, there was going to have to be immense pressure on, you know, all of uh, all of uh, Congress in order to make that happen. Right. And so that was only going to come from uh, strikes. In in my view, that's the only thing, you know, they weren't going to, you know, and it was only going to be. And, and that's how you get to the areas that are, you know, considered conservative is you have these strikes going on. Um, and so that was the plan as far as my concern. I didn't have any, you know, I, I would never, I would never, even if we made a, 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 a communist world say, everybody believe in this person and they're going to take us through. The whole point is to, uh, is for everyone to be checking each other based on the, the ideals and the ideology. So, yeah, I mean, I think. I think that that's right, but also I think that your an initial instinct that it would be helpful, it could be mm -hmm. really different and transformative to have a president or at least a senior political official oh. talking about those things and framing things in that way that is empowering to labor. And I think some some of the left is frustrated that regardless of what, whether you're the president, even in the positions you're still in that are pretty mighty, there doesn't seem to have been as much a, of a validation of the strike movements and that our political our left political spheres we would have hoped, principally and the choice to of of every um, progressive in the House barring Rashida Tlaib to vote to crush the rail strike in January was a big moment, a big yeah. disappointment moment for a lot of the left. And and so here's the thing. Not that anything is in a vacuum, so everything is connected, but the reason that we are at this place right now where uh, we've got, in the past three years, over 3,000 strikes and work stoppages um, that have happened. And the biggest, as you said, biggest uh, strike wave since the 70s is not because we voted certain people in or failed to vote certain people in. Right. It's It has to do with, and, and you could back it up to a bunch of things that happened along the way, but in general, it has to do with movements that people have created and intentional organizing that folks did. And, uh, and it's only going to grow because of that. There's a question, you know, the, 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 my problem with the idea of let's get somebody in that can help us is that that takes a lot of time and energy. And historically, it's taken time and energy away from, from organizing uh, a militant labor movement. Because the folks that, that do maybe see the bigger picture and would be part of organizing a militant labor movement get caught up in this two to three to four year thing that that they're staking their claim in and everything else falls to the side. So it's not, a, you know, in, in that case, uh, when I said that with Bernie, in my mind, he had a chance to win. Right. And it was already at, you know, at this certain point. But there is a danger in getting people distracted with elections. And and so and 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 I, and what is that distraction from? That distraction is from the movement that we need to create right now, which is a mass militant radical labor movement that uses the withholding of labor um, as a as a tool. And right now we can get to the point where 
there's immense power from that. So even if you want it to affect uh, legislation, things like that, if you could shut down, um, you know, if you can shut down whole industries or whole groups of industries um, and in certain in, in certain areas of industry, um, you could have a lot more effect than someone uh, who, you know, you spent four years trying to move up the ladder and, and maybe be able to pass one law possibly, right? Um, so, and not to say that those positions don't hold weight, obviously they do, but it's a question of where we spend our time and energy right now. And there's there's a lot more power in the movement that is currently growing. Yeah, it feels like that can cut sort of both ways where there is there are obviously people who are trying to be, engage and get progressives elected and things like that. But there's also the establishment call to say, well, things can get worse. So also put your energy into voting for the stopgap measure, the imperfect liberal, the Biden style candidate. And there yeah. are many people on the left who hear you say, well, electoralism isn't going to get us there. And they agree. And they say, well, I'm not even I don't even want to validate the status quo by voting for Biden, because that is in, in, in effect empowering the left establishment party and to to ignore us every four years and forever. Uh, and even that is is too much. And I, I have a lot of empathy, frankly, with that perspective. But of course, there are a whole lot of other people who say that that's incredibly destructive, that's disrespectful to the interests of the most marginalized who are going to be affected by a second Trump term or a DeSantis term or whatever that is. And so you do get people who are caught up in politics because of that tension, whether vote blue no matter who is going to save the republic, preserve our democracy. This is the kind of language that get, gets used. And that that fight eats up a lot of the airtime as well. Well, yeah, well, we'll, we'll look at this. I mean, I haven't even watched your show in the past six months, but I'm sure you've already talked about this, which is all the bullshit that Biden has pushed through. Um, and, you know, the, the railway workers, those sorts of things. They're, they're all things that Trump would have done, right? So in, in a lot of, ways, you know, that argument is, you know, something off over to the side, you know, at the same time, I think the focus is don't even get in those arguments. If somebody goes, I, you know, if somebody goes and they vote and vote and say, you know, hey, I did have that day off and I'm going to, you know, I did have time. I went by and vote, voted. That's fine. And I'm not, I'm not someone that is, uh, uh, saying that uh, the answer is to abstain. The answer, and, and if you do, whatever, but the answer is to organize on your job and to organize a, uh, a around issues that affect you and your colleagues now and turning that into a political body through the power of uh, of of even the threat of withholding labor. So I think, you know, um, the question of, of the, the, the even getting involved in that question, you know, is um, missing the point because that ha having that argument is just an argument between uh, should we vote for a Democrat or should we not, or should we vote, you know, and that's, that's, relegating the argument to this one little space. And the argument is this, that the effective means to getting the world that we want in the long term and in the short term is creating a mass militant radical labor movement. And we can be doing that right now, this year, you know, this month, and it is happening. And so, uh, you know, you know, um, that, uh, you know, I think we get sucked into those arguments. And if you're doing that, then the folks that are saying, well, you got to vote for this person, you can say, what are you doing in your life to actually make these changes happen? You know, and uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. 
I think the other reason why people do tend to find uh, discussions about electoral politics engaging in um, consuming is because it does seem accessible, uh, especially to people, the majority of people who aren't in organized workforces, and particularly to people who are in white collar jobs, just be honest, who don't really feel like they're going to organize their law firm or well you got to change their view or... you got to change their view on that yeah you know and because here's the thing is that yeah maybe they're not the first ones that'll get involved in things but as these movements grow they affect everyone and um and you know they can in- help organize you know other places as well and yes it does seem accessible and see that's the thing is that the trick is, you know, you, you look back at the, the civil rights movement and often it's said, we died in order to vote. No, vo- voting was seen as one of the ways to freedom. It wasn't like voting was the be all end all. It was saying we're being kept from our vote. We should be able to do that because This is a way for us to attain these material changes that we need. So, you know, and that wasn't even the only thing that was fought for, right? Yeah, it feels feels taboo to say, but I sometimes am, it it does strike me as somehow off that so much of the discourse from the Democratic Party about what it's going to do to serve it's black constituency, uh, constituency is still so focused on voting rights. And it's not, it's, it's difficult to say because there are attacks on voting rights. Republicans do try to make it more difficult for Americans to vote via various techniques, many of which are technically constitutional and are permissible. But it also does feel a little like narrow and like it is a placeholder for a, a much broader set of issues that voting rights are, enable Democratic Party to ignore by putting that particular issue on a pedestal. Exactly. So just like you, you, you brought up before, Biden telling railway workers they can't strike has an effect on all these workers all over the place. You're trying to organize people and people are like, well, Biden's just gonna, if it gets big enough, Biden's just going to say you can't do it. Right. And these strikes and these struggles are about the the issues that everybody that that black folks care about and everyone does, but specifically dealing with issues of poverty and how to get out of it, how to get paid more, how you know, all of these things are, you know, are are issues that he's um that that the Democratic Party are and and, and specifically him and his administration are pushing back against, but to just throw it up as being about voting rights without being what are being about what are you actually voting for, you know, is is a is a problem. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for five dollars a month at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast. That's patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for five dollars a month an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.